Good morning. Welcome to this week's View on Africa. I'm Stephanie Walters, the head of the Peace and Security Research Program at the Institute for Security Studies. And we're going to be speaking about the upcoming DRC elections once, once again. Um, so here we are. It's uh, December 5th. We have a few weeks before these elections are now due to take place on December 23rd. I think it's safe to say that we are going to be sticking to that election date. This is a question we've had for some time about whether or not that date will be maintained, but it looks as though it will be. Uh, the government is unlikely to change that now. Um, we have um, the beginning of campaigning, which started last week, and I'll look at the three big campaigns, um, look at some of the technical aspects of the um, election and what still needs to be done and where what the level of preparedness is. I'll also look at the um, various different international players and what their various positions are on the DRC elections, and then finally uh, present a few scenarios of what could happen in, 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 the, in the near future. Um, so I'll start with the Shadari campaign. Emmanuel Ramazani Shadari is the ruling party candidate, uh, the FCC. He was uh, nominated in August and he will be succeeding uh, Joseph Kabila. He is from Maniema. Um, and has essentially a very low political base uh, himself. He's not somebody who's participated in national level politics in an election before. Uh, so this is the first time he will be doing this. Um, Shadari, um, of course, has the benefit of access to state resources. In fact, although the campaigns formally started last week, he has been uh, appearing on television and in international and national settings for some time now. And so he really was able to get a jump on the other key candidates. Um, in short, he has presented an election platform. This is something of a, of a new feature of Congolese elections. In the past, there wasn't really much actual campaigning around platforms, and to some extent that hasn't changed dramatically, but at least he has presented uh, a budget um, which is higher than the budget that uh, the Kabila government has had over the last few years, and he's also introduced some novelties like um, developing tram lines in Kinshasa. Um, but for all intents and purposes, the kinds of platforms that we see presented in the DRC during these election campaigns don't make a uh, substantial difference. It tends to be uh, recognition, party affiliation, uh, your own political profile, and of course, very importantly, where you are from geographically. Moving on, we have Martin Fayoulou, who was uh, anointed uh, initially as the opposition unity candidate in meetings in the um, in, in Geneva at the end of October. Um, there was an agreement that had been um, mediated there with some help from South Africa, um, where all the, the seven key opposition leaders had put themselves um, through a voting process and where Fayulu had emerged as the unity candidate. Um, this vote did include Moïse Katumbi, Jean-Pierre Bemba, Vital Kamere, and Félix Tshisekedi, so all of the key figures. Fayulu and Freddy Matungulu were the two less well-known figures along with Adolf Muzitu. Um, Fayulu emerged as the unity candidate, um, and we thought that this was um, going to be something that everyone remained, maintained their commitment to, but less than 24 hours later, we saw that the UDPS, through its secretary general, withdrew their support to uh, Martin Fayulu, and not very long thereafter, Vital Kameri withdrew his support to Martin Fayulu. So in the end, we had two of the key, um, in fact, the, the leading candidates withdrawing their support for Fayulu. He continues to campaign as a unity candidate with the support of Moïse Katumbi and Jean-Pierre Bemba. Fayulu is from Bandundu, the western part of the DRC. Um, and with the support of Moïse Katumbi and Jean-Pierre Bemba, he also has access to Equateur province, where Bemba is from, and to the very important Katanga province, where Moïse Katumbi is from, and which he, um, which he was governor of for, for a very long time. Um, Fayulu himself, in the latest polls, does not have a, a huge following, um, but we'll, we'll see how much of those votes from Moïse Katumbi and Jean-Pierre Bemba he can grab. Of course, just a reminder, Moïse Katumbi and Jean-Pierre Bemba are not on the ballot because they were not admitted as presidential candidates. Um, Fayulu has started to campaign, but he's already encountered some significant differences, for, uh, difficulties. For example, the fact that the planes that he was meant to use to fly around during his campaign were not allowed to land in Kinshasa, um, uh, a, a phenomenon that some people have considered to be another way of the Congolese government blocking his campaign. Um, so we'll have to see how that pans out in the next few weeks. The Fayulu position at this point remains um, against the voting machines, the electronic voting machines 
vaccines which were introduced um, by the um, Independent Electoral Commission earlier this year, but at the same time firmly against any kind of boycott of this election. Um, and then finally, we have a, an, an, a third very um, significant political platform that um, has been, uh, that has seen the unification of the campaigns of Vital Camere and Felix Tshisekedi. Both of these candidates are admitted to the presidential contest and are on the ballot. Um, Felix Tshisekedi will be the presidential candidate and Vital Camere has been accorded a number of key positions in a future government, notably Prime Minister and some of the key ministries like Defense and Foreign Affairs. This is a very significant challenge to Fayulu. Um, both Vital Camere and Felix Tshisekedi are leaders in the polls for independent for, for the for the presidential candidates. Felix Tshisekedi polled at 36 percent in the most recent poll and is by far the most popular uh, um, and significant candidate. Um, with Vital Camere not far behind, and Vital Camere in particular leading in Eastern DRC. Um, that is an area, he is from South Kivu, and that is an area that he has delivered as well in the past, when in 2006 he was able to deliver that vote for Joseph Kabila, um, and he remains quite popular in that region. Felix Tshisekedi is from Kasai, and he will carry that region. Um, and so he does stand a very good chance, I think, in a free and fair election of emerging as a legitimate winner. Um, one of the things with that campaign that is unclear is the fact that Vital Kameri's name will remain on the ballot, the CNI, or in the voting machine. The CNI will not be able to remove Vital Kameri's name from the uh, voting ballot. Um, and so the question remains whether or not your average voter will understand that Felix Tshisekedi is asking um, voters for Vital Camere to vote for him. So that's one of the things that could potentially undermine uh, a free and fair election in favor of, of Felix Tshisekedi. Um, I will come back to the legislative elections a little bit later. I first want to finish with the presidential elections. That's tended to be our major focus, but the legislative elections are also very significant. I want to move on to just some of the technical aspects of what's going to be happening on December 23rd. The Independent National Electoral Commission maintains that it is prepared for these elections. Um, the overall confidence level, also according to the most recent poll in the CENI, is extremely low. There's a lot of high levels of distrust, close to 70% of those polled uh, do not trust the Independent Electoral Commission. But the CENI says it is prepared. It says it will be going ahead with the voting machines. Um, and it has not addressed the question of the 10, up to 10 million potentially fictional voters who are on the voters roll. And that number comes from an audit that was conducted by the International Organization of the Francophonie about eight months ago. So those are two key issues that have not been addressed. Um, other concerns that we've also discussed in the past are largely around logistical questions. This is the first time that the Congolese government will be organizing elections on its own entirely without the support of the international community and most importantly without the logistical support of MONUSCO, the UN mission in the DRC, which had been standing by to provide 80 million US dollars worth of air support, which is a key element of organizing elections in the Congo because of the poor infrastructure. So we have some very serious concerns about the um, Congolese government's ability to organize these elections. The Congolese army has already been asked to assist. That too, of course, is an issue of concern, especially in a country where civil military relations are often extremely strained and where there have been uh, exactions and uh, poor behavior on the Congolese army's behalf. So that is another big concern. The, uh, the, uh, Congolese, the Catholic Church excuse me, um, put out a report um, earlier this month where it once again um, lays very clearly out that it does not want the, voters, uh, the voter machine, voting machines to be used. It criticizes the political environment, the exclusion of candidates like Moise Katumbi and Jean-Pierre Bemba, and of course the question of the fictional voters, and expresses concerns about the logistical preparations. Moving on to the observers. Um, Senko, the Catholic Church, is going to be one of the largest group of domestic observers. This is absolutely essential because there will be far more uh, domestic observers deployed than there will be international observers. And it will be key to establishing what happens on the actual polling day. So Senko is, is going to have around 5,000 observers that will be stationed throughout the country. 
Opposition parties have a right to have a, uh, have a member of their party also deployed to the polling stations. This too is essential. Often in the past, though, this hasn't been terribly effective. Opposition parties have not always been able to organize and mobilize people to go into the polling stations, and sometimes this has been a question of resources. Uh, hopefully that will be um, different this time. I think that with the level of momentum to, um, to try and push for a credible election, potentially there will be improvement on that front. SADC will also be sending observers, and so will the African Union. Those will essentially be the two largest international delegations. Finally, the uh, other component, the other international group that will be there is the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie. Um, but between the AU, SADC, and the OIF, there won't be more than several hundred international observers. So that's why I emphasize that the domestic observer component is essential. The European Union has not been accredited, nor have other organizations that tend to be involved in these kinds of observer missions like the Carter Center. And remembering that the EU is in the process, the uh, EU of course has imposed sanctions on a, a number of, uh, of, of Congolese officials, including the ruling party candidate. So it's no great surprise that the EU is not going to be able to send a, an observer mission. Um, I want to now turn to the response of, or where things stand with some of the key players. Um, First, the African Union. We have seen over the last year some more, some stronger statements coming from the African Union, especially from Moussa Faki himself, in particular around human rights violations in response to public protests and the crackdowns that we've seen by security forces where often we've seen loss of life and a disproportionate use of force. Um, so we had thought that at some point there might be more momentum um, from the African Union to really lead the push for credible elections. And that, that is really where, where we have been emphasizing, where we've placed, been placing our emphasis in the last few months since Kabila uh, announced that he would not be standing for a third mandate. It now looks as though the AU will not be um, pushing really very much more. Um, on this question of credibility. Um, Smile Shergi, the head of the PSC, was in Congo uh, a few weeks ago, um, and he has said in media interviews um, things like, for example, that the voting machine is not really an issue, that he has tried it, um, and he thinks it works uh, more or less fine. Um, we, we don't really anticipate that the AU is going to take a more critical voice at this stage ahead of this election. It remains to be seen how they respond to what will happen at the polls and to what will happen when the um, announcement is made of who, who wins. Um, but certainly for now, it's not a strong voice pushing for credible elections. Um, SADC has more or less, I think, withdrawn from this conversation. Uh, at this point, it has, of course, offered to, to su provide support to the Congolese government, which is, it, it traditionally has done. It more recently met Hage Gangob, the, the president, the acting, well, the current rotating president of, of SADC, met with Shadari a few weeks ago. Um, these are all the kinds of signals that would indicate um, support for the Congolese elections and for the process, rather than a, a real engagement with some of the key technical and political issues that, that I mentioned earlier. So um, no real um, uh, expectation that the AU or SADC will, will, will push further there. South Africa has played an important role over the last few months and chose in particular to try and facilitate the um, election of a unity candidate. It was involved twice in mediating that process, once under the ANC and then once independently. Um, and if I've addressed that already earlier today, or earlier in this, this, this discussion. Um, South Africa, of course, um, has changed its position since uh, Cyril Ramaphosa came to power. Um, it's not really clear what it's, work, what it's trying to push for now so close ahead of the elections, but South Africa will be on the front line of dealing with this crisis when it takes up its seat in the Security Council in January where the DRC uh, election aftermath is sure to be high on the agenda. Um, the European Union, I've already addressed, the conversation about sanctions is happening, I believe, this week, uh, whether those sanctions on, uh, on Congolese officials will be re renewed or maintained, and I think that we, we expect that they will be. So no particular change coming from the, from the EU at this stage. A big question is Angola. Angola has been a key player in pushing Kabila not to stand for a third mandate, and it's been a key player in trying to push for a return to stability. The crisis that has been going on in the DRC as a result of the continuous delay, elections were meant to be held in 2016, has created a lot of political instability in the country, a lot of popular 
pressure. Um, and this is something that Angola has, has picked up on and has acted upon in pressuring Kabila not to stand. It has not really been able, though, to translate that into um, a, a free and fair political environment ahead of these elections. Um, the relationship at this point is not uh, a very good one. We've seen, um, we saw some very sudden expulsions, both of illegal immigrants and of refugee populations living on the Angolan Congolese border, on the Angolan side of the uh, Angolan Congolese border, uh, in in the last few months, and creating a, a, a humanitarian crisis on the on the Congolese side. Um, it's unclear why Angola would be doing something like that at this particular sensitive time in Congo's political. Um, situation, but certainly the relationship between the two countries at this point is not a very positive one. Um, finally, in terms of scenarios, before I open up for questions, um, I, I think to reiterate, we, we don't expect this contest to be free and fair. Um, we have 10 million potentially fictional voters. We have a voting mechanism with which the electorate is unfamiliar. And we don't know whether that can be somehow hijacked. It, there hasn't been subject to an independent audit by a by a IT specialist, so confidence in that mechanism is very low. We have a political environment where the playing field is not level. One of the candidates who has had access to state resources and continues to have access to state resources um, and can uh, campaign at a very different level than the other candidates. Um, and we have uh, we have. Uh, um, uh, very serious concerns about the logistical preparations. This is a gigantic country. It's the first time the Congolese government is doing this. And so a scenario where we may see chaotic conditions at polling stations or alternatively uh, significant delays in allowing voters to vote is, is not to be ruled out. Um, having said that we don't expect this scenario, this election to be free and fair, so the scenario is that we, we think we're going to have a, a, a Shadari victory, will be announced by the CNI. Uh, this, of course, will um, be contested by the opposition candidates, um, and we will then likely see protests in the streets of Kinshasa and in other big cities. I think we can anticipate that the government will respond, as it always has, with by deploying security forces. So we're likely to see confrontations where people will lose their lot, where, the, where there will be loss of life. Um, one of the calculations that international actors have been making is just how um, great is this protest? How, how many days does it go on for? How significant is it? Can it be contained? And so on and so forth. So those are the questions that we can't yet answer. Um, I think that if we look at the return of, for example, um, Martin Fayulu first to Congo recently, where he was received by several thousand people in the streets of Kinshasa, and then an even greater crowd coming out for the return of, of uh, Felix Tshisekedi and Vital Kamere, we can see that people are not uh, people have strong views about who they want to vote for. Um, people have strong views about being making their vote count and having this be a legitimate process. So I anticipate that the level of protest will be high. Um, and we will likely see uh, post-election violence.